Interesting. This is um so thank you so much for being here. This is Elaine with Field, who is a are you like gold? I am a gold gold master gardener, which means yeah. how many mm. does that mean? Too many. A thousand or a thousand. And a lot of that is spent teaching people about native plants. And you would do a lot of work here at the demonstration garden. And there's ephemerals growing out here. It's amazing out here if you ever get to have a tour. But Elaine is going to help share um, some of the native species that can take place of our invasives. So thank you so much, Elaine, for being here. I really appreciate it. And then Mary will join after. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Okay. okay. Now, are we going to do the questions? Yes, good point. Yes, there will be questions. So make sure you uh, save your questions. And we do definitely want you to have time for questions because we, want, we know you might have some for your backyard. Thanks for being here. Having this. Okay, well, as we said, I've been around a while. I've actually been master gardener for over 15 years. So um, I want to talk today about some uh, native plants that I've had a lot of experience with. Not necessarily my favorite ones, but a lot of experience with. And uh, for those of you that have driven in here before we you probably recognize this picture um, out here at the, um, the by the parking lot as you come in the front drive um, this garden was developed uh, several years ago right janet <laughs> and uh, we uh have probably 50 percent uh of the uh species in here are uh native plants and the others we've kind of given thought if they're non-native we have given thought to whether um some of our uh native bees and uh, other insects butterflies and so forth do like some of those plants as well so i've researched some of this and this is what we've come up with um we have some zinnias that we plant some annuals but the uh the insects really love those. So anyway, um, okay. Oh, maybe I'm not aiming at the right. It's not moving. Try to get closer to the 45 degree angle to the left top, or I'll just change the angle to the left top. Oh, that might make it. Oh, it's on. Will the touch screen work? <laughs> it usually works too well. Yeah. <laughs> it worked when we uh, I know. did the practice. I know. Okay. Um, just a few pictures. That I'm not going to really talk about any of these, but uh, these are some of my favorites. Just to give you an idea that native plants can be very colorful, very interesting, like that stuffed cabbage flower in the middle there. Oh, and I didn't do it. Oh, we're, it's working now. Yes. Okay. Um, right now, out here in our little native area that Lace was mentioning in the introduction, we have the celadine, or it's also commonly known as wood poppy. They're in full bloom out there, and they are gorgeous. Um, it's a woodland plant, but I do believe one of our members, I think Marsha, has planted these in, in her landscape at home, and they adapt very well to your yard. So it's just, just put them in the shade. That's just a wild potential plant that grows wild? It's, or it's, it's out here in our woods right now, blooming. Wow, that's cool. Yeah. yeah. And it's easy to grow. If you go out here and look, it keeps moving into different areas. I think the ants have something to do with moving the seed. Um, but it's, uh, it's very prolific and it's, but it's not invasive. It's not aggressive or it doesn't crowd out any other plants. And you see here in this picture on the right hand side, it pairs nicely with the Virginia bluebells. Um, and it, um, will intermittently throughout the summer, um, will bloom, not as prolifically as right now in the spring, but 
but you'll see a few blossoms every now and then, even in the middle of the summer. No, <laughs> weird. <laughs> okay. And purple cone flower. Uh, everybody probably has uh, had some experience with purple cone flower. Uh, I've been growing it um, 40 years. My brother gave me a start many, many years ago. And it is a workhorse in the garden. Anybody can grow this. Even if you say you have a brown uh, thumb, um, it's it's a very, once it gets established, it's a very, very hardy plant. Um, bees, butterflies, love it. Uh, it's a host plant for the uh, silvery checker spot, butterfly, caterpillars, and um, goldfinches love it. Uh, I've driven up out here when we've had it in the garden, in the uh, pollinator garden, and um, have scared many, many goldfinch out of that when I got out of the car, out of the, the cum flower um, bush. I assume that's what they look like when they bloom. Um, the nice thing about it is, um, number one, it blooms from usually late June through frost will kill it. Um, I leave the um, debris over the winter and you see in this picture down here on the left bottom, um, that's what one looks like, what the flower heads look like after the birds have picked it clean in the garden over <laughs> the winter because sometimes there's not a lot to eat. So they will resort to um, eating the seeds of the purple cauliflower. Now let's see if it. Now <laughs> try what this one right here. I put it right here. So it doesn't work. When you try pushing the green button. No, I don't okay. know what's it's happening. The angle of the laptop uh, toward the transmitter. Can you try the green button? I tried to arrow forward. Try to arrow forward. Now it's not it's going to be a bad day for it. Maybe turn the laptop forward. Oh, well. <laughs> we'll do it manually. <laughs> um, another um, native plant, and this was a rather large one, so you want room if you're going to plant this one. Um, Joe Pye and um, another member of the same family is bone set. It's a little bit smaller, shorter plant, but they're both um, magnets for bees, butterflies, uh, uh, monarchs, and swallowtails just go crazy over it. Uh, but uh, they use it a lot in uh, uh, prairie restoration. It loves uh, wet feet. So if you have an area that's kind of um, swampy, mar marshy looking, uh, or, you know, a rain garden would be fine for it. Um, you can use it there. You just want to make sure you've got plenty of room. Um, and it blooms in uh, mid to late summer. And you can see sometimes when you're driving down the roads, uh, uh, roadsides have not been disturbed. They will uh, start popping up and uh, blooming, um, like I said, late summer, August, you can start looking for it out in um, natural areas. Okay, let's see now. Obedient plant. Um, I've had for many years, and I've had this plant in my garden for many years, somewhat a friend, I, I, and I use the term loosely now because this plant sometimes gives me fits. It's been a love-hate relationship. <laughs> but um, it grows anywhere. <laughs> you can say it likes sun, it likes shade. Um, it's 
it crawls everywhere. It's a member of the mint family. So if you've had experience growing mint, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, but I have to say I have new respect for it after all these years because I didn't get rid of it. Well, you can't get rid of it. If you've ever tried to pull it out of your garden, it, it, you leave all these little um, rhizomes. They don't all come out. And then, you know, the next year, it pops more of them. So anyway, I, I just finally gave up trying to um, eradicate it. And last summer, I had a nice crop of it growing up not too far outside the kitchen window. And I looked out one day last, it's early September when it was blooming and it'll go to frost as well. Um, and there were two ruby throated hummingbirds out there feasting on the obedient plant. I couldn't get a camera fast enough. And if I tried to get out the door where they would hear me and, and they laughed as it try to go out and capture the moment that it didn't work. But just believe me, when they say hummingbirds are attracted to it, they really, really are. Okay. We can go to the next one. Oh, hey, that could be it. Um, New England Aster, I raised for maybe not as many years as some of the others, but um, I've, I've had it a number uh, long enough to know that it's it is a, a fairly easy to grow plant doesn't take a lot of maintenance just like the others. Um, we want to plant it in the sun, and it is a fall blooming plant, which um, is important because there's a lot of butterflies and bees that love this plant. Um, and you have to remember, we, we got to provide sources of food and nesting material for these uh, insects in the fall. And we have a lot of butterflies uh, that require, they, they live on this. So um, this is another one that would be easy to get started in the garden. The only thing is sometimes it gets a little leggy about oh, late June, I just go in and whack it down uh, to about a foot high. And that way it puts out a little more lateral shoots and it doesn't get so top heavy and uh, fall over. So um, that's another one to consider. Is that a granule too? Oh yes, they all are. Great. Okay. Uh, let's see. So try this one. Okay. Oh, it's Whoa! I like the reason at this time. That's my goodness. Oh, I went too far. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Then we're gonna talk about just one grass um, that I've had some experience with. Um, I really love this plant. Some people curse it, but I have some really shady areas in my yard. And this is a grass that loves the shade. In fact, it would probably grow almost anywhere except out in like full sun in real dry conditions. But uh, it, it's very tolerant of a lot of situations. Um, I didn't realize until we did some more research on it that it, they use it in stabilizing slopes because it does have some pretty significant roots. Although, if you don't want it somewhere, if it comes up in the crack in the sidewalk, it is fairly easy to pull out, believe it or not. I, I, it, it is, it's just one of those plants. It's kind of like the obedient plant. I keep it around for entertainment. But really, um, <laughs> Uh, these little inflorescences that you see hanging there, they turn a nice golden color in the fall and they kind of dry out a little and when the wind blows, they just kind of gently rustle. It's really relaxing. Um, but yes, if it does reseed, you can get rid of it. You can pull it out where you don't want it. 
And then we'll just talk about one vine. Um, I, I had to be kind of funny and put poison ivy in here, but I, there's a reason why. <laughs> Take a look at the middle one, that is poison ivy. And how many, how many leaflets do you see? Okay, we've learned the rule. Okay, that one on the left is uh, pipe. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, I, pipe vine. Um, and of course, this is trumpet here on this side. But the one I want to talk about is Virginia creeper, which is, uh, it loves my yard for some reason. Um, but it's another one. You really don't have to do anything to it. It, it will adapt to a lot of conditions. It doesn't matter if it's dry or moist soil. Um, it can grow up trees, but it also can be used as a ground cover. And now mine never has its brilliant color in the fall for some reason, I don't know why, but I found this picture somewhere just to prove to myself that it is you know, a colorful plant. And I have seen it elsewhere very colorful. Um, anyway, and I didn't realize it was useful. It's a host to a number of moth caterpillars and it does provide food because it, it produces little berries, uh, pro provides food and nesting places for birds. So it's another useful native plant. So just remember, it has five leaves. Poison ivy has three. Whoops. <laughs> oh, we're going. Yeah, that battery really did the trick. <laughs> okay. I'll hurry here because um, I know we want to get on to Mary's presentation. Um, so just, just a few notes to remember when you are dealing with native plants, if you're transplanting, some of them will be very resentful of that. I, I've had that problem with cone flower in the past. Uh, seeds are an excellent way to get them started. But if you do decide, somebody gives you a, a start, your transplant, just make sure, even though it may be one that everyone says, oh, it can thrive in drought. The first year, you want to make sure that plant has adequate moisture. You don't want to drown it, but you also don't want to withhold the water because there, it's critical time for them to develop their roots, which also this next um, statement here, because the first year these plants are doing their best to develop a good root system, you do not want to fertilize them because fertilizers contain a lot of nitrogen and what does nitrogen <laughs> grow up? <clears throat> Foliage growth. We don't want foliage growth in the first year. Well, we don't want an abundance of it, but we want root development. So just lay off fertilizer. You can do that later if you feel like it needs it, but most of them do not. And there's some native plants. If you fertilize them, you will kill them. <laughs> um, <clears throat> if they appear to be struggling the first season, don't panic. I thought I killed a cone flower. The next year it came back and it said hi. <laughs> and it would be there every time I go by it. The third year, I was giving away some of its prodigy. <laughs> so, so just just remember that, that, that they're a little different than some of the exotics you may have dealt with. Um, a few references I use, these are all good um, reference materials. Um, if you have any questions about plants you may be interested in putting in, in your yard. In your all right, that's all I have. Do something great. <laughs> Thanks, Elaine. Uh, anyone have a question for Elaine? If not, Mary's going to set up and 
continue our discussion about herbaceous alternatives for invasive plants. If you have any questions and you're on Zoom, pop it in the chat. Thank you. Hey there, let me get my slideshow going and we'll go through. Oops. I think I advanced too far. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so now I'm ready. All right, is, is everybody able to hear me and see this slide? Uh, you sound great. Great. Um, well, hello everybody and wonderful Elaine. It was so fun to hear about your native plant expertise and experience. Um, so I'll be talking today, um, kind of going toward the dark side, talking about native or invasive plants that are used in landscapes and then what to plant that's native instead. Um, and I'll just give you a quick introduction. I know a lot of you have probably already heard me talk, um, but my name is Mary Wells and I work for Southern Indiana Cooperative Invasives Management in support of our Indiana Invasives Initiative. So we are statewide, even though our name implies otherwise. Um, we have funding through the NRCS and that project has us um, working with everybody throughout the state. We have six regional specialists and a project coordinator um, and Hancock County is in my region of service. Uh, this is our quick map. Um, you can go to our website and get more information here. And uh, what we're trying to do in each county, including Hancock, is to develop and support local groups called SIGMAs that um, are formed to manage invasive species across various types of land ownership locally. So this is the next door SIGMA, Henry County. Uh, this is one up in Hamilton County. And then we've got one over in T Tippecanoe. Um, and this is the map of the currently um, established SISMAs in blue. The ones that are in orange are kind of working through some organization and then green have raised their hand, but we're not quite there in the organizational stage. So I don't wanna go too in depth, but we will just briefly review all of the definitions so we know what's invasive, what's native, um, and the importance of using native plants in our landscapes. And then we'll talk about some common invasive plants that are in our landscapes intentionally and some native alternatives to use instead. And then just go through a few opportunities to get more information and be involved. So this is the, the, the definition that we use for native species. It's a plant or animal that has evolved in a given place over a period of time, sufficient to develop a complex and essential relationship with the physical environment and other organisms in a given ecological community. So it's very open-ended. I think the takeaway message is everything is connected. Um, the insects eat plants, the, plant, the birds eat insects, et cetera. And invasive species is one of a type of organism that's first and foremost non-native, and then it causes some sort of harm. That's usually um, some sort of harm to human, animal, or plant health, often economic and environmental. I won't go into any more, just too much discussion. Um, there's negative impacts and invasive species are pretty vast, and there's a lot of overlap between these but uh, it's an under-realized threat for sure. Um, they are the second leading cause for loss of biodiversity and the second leading threat to our forest, the first of which is human development for both of those. They account for one third of all species extinctions in the past 400 years. Um, and that's even before we're really getting into the effects of climate change, which are underway. And the annual costs are greater than uh, the cost of all other natural disasters combined, according to a 2012 United States Geological Survey study. And a reminder that weedy, the terms weedy or aggressive does not necessarily mean a plant is invasive. We have a lot of natives like that Virginia creeper that Elaine mentioned 
that um, some people call weeds, but they're, they're actually native. Uh, they serve a lot of beneficial um, functions for wildlife. Um, and some of them are really beautiful. Like Elaine said, the, the winter or the Virginia creeper has a beautiful color and the birds eat the fruits and there's insects that eat the leaves. Um, our common blue violet um, it is actually a larval host for our fritillary butterflies. So this funky little caterpillar becomes this beautiful orange butterfly. And just a reminder, our pollinators, our birds and our other wildlife are at risk. We're seeing population declines. The monarch is an example that um, everybody knows. It's a butterfly we all love and their, their populations have declined drastically in just 20 years. And there's also a study showing our bird populations are going down fairly fast. Um, and as we know, uh, our native birds, while they eat bird seed at our feeders, um, they actually need caterpillars to raise their young. So if we don't have native plants, we don't have caterpillars and we don't have um, songbirds like this Carolina chickadee. Invasive species are, we brought them here. A lot of them were uh, introduced accidentally. Some of them were introduced intentionally. And so now we're working on ways to stop their spread and to remove them from um, our natural areas. And the ones highlighted in yellow are the ones that we have some active control over. It's hard to control the birds. It's hard to control the weather. And it's hard to control a plant once it starts growing. And just a reminder, last year we have a new rule that regulates 44 species of invasive plants. Um, and that's regulated through the DNR Division of Entomology and Plant Pathology. Um, the ones that are regulated in, under that law, we're only gonna be talking about one today because this, this list of about 22 species uh, is the ones that were previously or currently in their nursery trade um, elsewhere. Uh, and then we also regulate other plants under other um, rules. Um, one of them is purple loose strife, and we'll be talking about that today. So Elaine talked about this in a little bit of detail, but why do you want to use um, al native alternatives? And I'm calling them alternatives. It's kind of awkward to say. Um, but they do have comparable desirable features with our native landscaping that we're used to. Um, they have beautiful flowers, they make nice ground covers, they have fall and winter color and interest, they can provide privacy and structure, and some of them even have edible fruits and nuts. Probably not any of the ones I'll be talking about today, but tune in next month and you will get a, a lot more information there. Uh, while some of our native alternatives um, well, some alternatives are non-native and non-invasive. Um, I think it's really essential that we incorporate native plants into our landscape. So, you know, some species, while it may not be invasive, it's not really supporting much wildlife. And we're at a point where we need to start supporting our wildlife. Um, we need to start giving back and providing homes for all the insects and birds and other wildlife that we have been displaced. Um, so they support our local wildlife. They're adapted to this region. So low maintenance, typically if they're the right plant for the right place. And if they escape, not a big deal. They're supposed to be here. Um, so we'll go through them by the types of species. Uh, talking first about grasses. So um, I'm talking only about one invasive grass today, um, which is Chinese silver grass. It's probably the most commonly used grass in our landscapes. And it is still um, legal to plant this species in Indiana. Um, so it hasn't been regulated, but it has been ranked as a high level invasive. So they're at points um, in the future, there may be some regulation. So um, it's usually Chinese silver grass. There's also giant miscanthus. Um, sometimes it's variegated, but they all kind of have that feathery seed head. Um, they spread by rhizomes, uh, and they also spread by seed. They typically only grow in open sunny areas. And this is the current distribution map of reported infestations. There's likely more infestations that have yet to be re reported. So I think this species, switchgrass, is the best um, invasive, or sorry, native plant to use instead of switchgrass. Let me get back to my slideshow. Um, 
it's upright, clump forming, it spreads by rhizomes, uh, very attractive foliage um, and clouds of feathery seed heads later in the season. And then it stays upright all winter long. So it's really nice if you don't cut it back because it provides winter interest. Um, and the seeds are used by birds and small mammals. Um, they also use as habitat. Sometimes if it's big enough, they can nest in there. And it is a host plant to our skipper butterflies. So the caterpillars feed on some species of switch or some species feed on switchgrass. And there are a lot of cultivars out there for this. If you want something that's blue, if you want something that's kind of got that reddish tinge in this photo here, and uh, just highlighting that that is our Chinese silvergrass alternative. Um, other native grass alternatives. There's more out there. Um, and then Elaine uh, also mentioned the, um, the river oats or the, the Northern sea oats it has several names. Um, but the ones at the top I think are easiest to find um, and the most behaved uh, in a landscape. The little blue stem and the prairie drop seed are nice, um, short in stature, so they don't flop if it's in the winter. Um, there's also, so little blue stem, prairie drop seed, big blue stem, a little taller, um, can flop in the winter, uh, Canada wild rye, um, fast growing, Fox sedge, which is a sedge, not a grass, um, is a really nice plant, especially if you've got um, moist soil conditions. June grass is very attractive, but it's a shorter stature. And then Indian grass, beautiful tall grass, but it, it can flop. Um, so it's one that you wanna make sure has some support. Um, or it's nice if you're just sowing nothing but Indian grass, it can support itself. Um, I feel like we didn't really get a chance to stop for questions. Have any of them come up uh, that Vicki or Elaine or um, Elaine or Lace? I'll take that as a note. <laughs> so we'll just move right along. Um, so we, we I'm another... sorry, no, no question. Okay, okay um, good. It, it takes me a little while to check the chat. I have to. I'm using my phone tonight. Sorry about that. Great. Well, I will try not to overwhelm because I, I love native plants um, and I do talk about invasives a lot, but I love talking about natives too. So um, so this is one that we're going to start seeing here in a, in a week or so. Um, it's a woodland invader called um, Dame's Rocket. And gosh, isn't it pretty? It's, well, it's pretty awful. Um, it invades woodland areas. Um, this is an area off of a trail near my house and it can spread like crazy. It's actually related to garlic mustard. It's in the mustard family. Um, and it has these white to pink to purple flowers in the spring. The um, one thing I'll just point out is it's got these teeth leaves. It's actually related to money plant. Um, but money plant isn't as highly invasive as Dame's Rocket. And Dame's Rocket is regulated in the state. So I wanna point out that Dame's Rocket has four petals. That's important. Most of our garlics have four petals, um, which distinguish it from some of the native alternatives to the species that I'll be talking about. But the problem is it spreads prolifically by seed um, and people actually don't realize this, this isn't native and so they welcome it into their yards. So I have neighbors in my neighborhood that I need to figure out a way to talk to them and let them know it's actually not um, meant to be here and it's out competing our native plants. So as you can see, it's all over our state and throughout the Northern part of the United States. The first, um, the best native alternatives for this um, Dame's Rocket are our native phloxes. Um, so they, if, as you can see, have five petals. This species is known as woodland phlox. Um, it's blooming now, probably, um, maybe just finishing up. Uh, it's a short stature plant. It gets about 12 to 15 inches tall and it loves shade and tall, um, sorry, shade and rich, moist organic soils. Um, just a lovely plant and the flowers are various colors. And then um, a little later in the season, we have our tall phlox that's um, also known as garden phlox and it gets pretty tall, um, a mentorite two to, feet, 
two to four feet tall. Um, and it has a fairly um, tolerant rain soil conditions, but not too dry. Um, and it can get a little powdery mildew, um, but otherwise it's, I'm just so happy with this plant in my garden and it will self seed. There are some other Dames Rocket alternatives. Um, some of them that uh, alternatives were covered by Elaine. Um, Virginia Bluebells is excellent. Um, the one top center is Bradbury's Monarda. It's a bee balm, but it likes shaded conditions. Uh, I put blue false indigo up there in the upper right. Um, it's technically a sunny plant, but it likes moist conditions and it blooms early, early in the spring. So it's just a big, beautiful plant to consider adding to your gar garden. It can get almost be the size of a shrub. Um, goat's beard is another big, beautiful shady plant. Um, makes a nice back border, um, beautiful flowers and just really impressive plant. It's hard to believe it's native. One of my favorite all time um, top five, uh, it's in my top five native plants for landscaping, downy skullcap. Um, it's a beautiful blue flower in early summer. Bumblebees love it and it does self seed, but not, not, it doesn't ever get out of control. It's just a lovely upright. It gets about two to three feet tall. And then in the bottom right is blue star. Um, and there's a, there's cultivars out there, but it's just a really delicate um, plant. It has nice foliage, gets about two feet tall, and then these really beautiful striking clusters of flowers and it's star-shaped flowers. Um, and then it really gets a nice um, fall color on the foliage. Um, some other native wildflowers for shade include one of our um, beard tongue, hairy beard tongue, um, and it, it actually likes drier situations. Fire pink um, is a beautiful native. It does go dormant in the heat of the summer, but it, if you want some color, um, some red color in the spring, it's the one for you. Um, Jacob's Ladder, uh, beautiful ground cover, really lacy foliage with a blue flower in the spring. A uh, false sunflower is actually a fairly large plant that likes um, shade. Um, very easy to grow and um, it, it does bloom earlier than the other sunflower plants that you might be used to. Uh, the wood poppy we've already talked about. Um, one thing about wood poppy is it gets these little seed pods and they're forming about now and you can just break them open and then sprinkle them and next year uh, the ants will help you plant them and you will have wood, more wood poppies elsewhere. Um, it does have a yellow sap that might stain your skin so you might want to wear gloves. Wild geranium is a gorgeous um, plant. It's just starting to bloom this time of year in our woodlands and it makes a really nice landscape plant. Uh, and then wild columbine, another beautiful plant loved by hummingbirds. Um, so they're just starting to come here um, from their migration. And that's when the columbines bloom and, and really columbines are the one plant that are intended, one, the one um, pollinator that are intended to be pollinated by um, hummingbirds. Did I say that right? I don't think so. <laughs> Columbine is pollinated by ruby-throated hummingbirds. There we go. Uh, so we're talking about loose strife. Um, this is some people's guilty pleasure because um, it is a really beautiful plant, um, but it's a wetland invader. It was a, it introduced accidentally on in ships ballast, ballast and then intentionally as ornamentals. So it sneaks into people's landscapes um, intentionally these days, but it is regulated in our state. Um, it has opposite leaves um, and these dense spikes of purple flowers, and it can take over acres and acres of wetlands. And each plant can produce a million seeds. So it's just, it's a monster. Um, and, you know, it forms these monocultures. It, it reduces the biodiversity of our wetlands and compromises wildlife habitat. So a no-go in my book. Um, and this is the reported spread of the species. I'm really thankful that there's actually a biocontrol that some people use for this. It's not 100% successful, but it, there's a little beetle that will eat this plant. Um, so instead of, of um, purple loosestrife, I recommend rose milkweed, also known as swamp milkweed. It likes wet feet too, um, and it is not going to take over and it will play well with all the other native plants in the wetland areas. 
and it supports a lot of pollinators, um, including bumblebees. They all love the nectar that's produced. And then just like all the other um, milkweed plants, it's one of the hosts for a monarch butterfly caterpillar. This plant, even though it does like wet areas, it'll do okay if you have nice, rich um, garden soil. Um, it, it won't do well if you have drought, but it's not um, one that you, you can consider using in your regular landscape as long as it's nice and sunny and it gets enough moisture. Um, and mil milkweeds are in general not browsed by deer. And that's our purple loose strife alternative. Um, some other ones that you could consider that um, either they're bloom fair, you know, fairly early, they have that color or they like wet um, soil conditions. Cardinal flower and blue lobelia are related. They're both lobelia species. Um, and then we have another bee balm, the wild bergamot, and that one gets a bit taller and likes the full sun. Swamp rose mallow is one of our native hib uh, hibiscus plants. A uh, beautiful plant, nice and tall, gets about four or five feet tall and, and does really well if you've got a little bit of a wet area. Um, our blazing stars do well in wet areas or regular soil moisture. And you might've remembered, Lace, or, I'm sorry, Elaine talking about obedient plants. So I won't go any further on that one, but it's a really cool plant. Actually, I don't know if Elaine mentioned this, but if you move those flowers, um, it's almost like you're doing like a fake flower, like the, the blooms will move and stay put. So you can kind of position the flower and that's why it's called obedient plant. Um, we have a few beard tongue that are a wetland species. So calico and then a fox club, which has white flowers are excellent for areas that have a little bit of soil moisture. Elaine already mentioned New England aster. I won't go into that. And then pickerel weed in the bottom right. Um, if you've got uh, pond edge, this is a great plant. It does like to be uh, in the water most of the time, but it's a beautiful plant to include uh, in a shoreline planting. Speaking of uh, plants that like wet feet, um, this is an invasive called yellow iris. It's not um, to be confused with the yellow German iris. Um, this one lives in the wetlands and it can be an emergent plant like a cattail. Um, and it produces seeds and then it produces really extensive rhizomes. And I admit, I am totally guilty of having this in my yard at one point. And when I found out it was invasive, I went oh, and like dug it up and got rid of it. But it's really hard to control once it's established. So um, just planter beware, please avoid this plant. Um, and this is the current range map, but I, Personally, I'm aware of it being more extensive than that in Indiana. And why would you plant that plant when you can have our blue flag iris, which is a beautiful native. Um, it gets about the same height um, and it can handle both wet and medium soil moisture. And it's an uh, early bloomer. You get this, it's gonna be blooming here within a couple, a few weeks, I believe. Um, and it supports our um, insects and it's Again, not browsed by deer, so it's safe to have um, without having to worry about maintenance. Um, so that yellow iris alternative. Um, so some other yellow iris alternatives. Um, we have several species of goldenrod, including Riddell's goldenrod that like wet feet. Uh, cup plant is an excellent plant to include in an area. It's, it's fairly large, so keep that in mind, but um, it's a really nice flowering plant um, with those daisy light flowers. Culver's root is, I just think it's such a beautiful plant. Um, it almost looks like a candelabra when it blooms and it does like that wet soil condition. Um, the bottom left is cut leaf cone flower. Um, it's, it's fairly large plant, does really well in, in wet areas, but it, it will spread quite a bit. Uh, I threw in Ohio spider wart just to add a little bit of color and it's shorter. It's two feet tall and it likes wet to normal soil moisture. Um, sneeze weed is one of my personal top five favorite landscape plants that are native um, and it blooms in the fall. So you'll have um, those blooms in September through October. And then we have wild senna, which is a pollinator magnet. You can, if you get close to wild senna, you can actually hear all the bees just buzzing in there. It's such an amazing plant. 
but it's big and it does seed quite a bit. So another plant that um, planter be aware of what it may become. <laughs> um, I'll just go through these very quickly because I could go on for days about native perennials. Um, we've already talked about purple coneflower, but um, butterfly milkweed is a really um, wonderful native landscape plant. It grows up all along our roadsides. It's two inches or two feet tall. Um, orange flowers that are um, enjoyed by a lot of pollinators and then the monarchs will eat the, the caterpillars will eat the foliage. Um, Black-eyed Susans, uh, we have a couple asters. Aromatic aster is my personal favorite for landscaping. It's mounding about three, it gets up to three feet wide and it's covered in flowers. Mine bloom until October. Even, I think I had some blooming until almost December last year. Um, our coreopsis, including the lance leaf coreopsis, are excellent landscape plants. Early bloomers, so you've got early yellow color. Um, mountain mint, um, we have this one's slender leafed or narrow leafed mountain mint, but we have several species. Um, most of them are growing in the sun, but some of them grow in the shade. A wild petunia, it's not actually a petunia, but it looks like one. It only gets about two feet or a foot and a half tall and it blooms all summer long. Uh, one caveat is it does produce a good amount of seed, so you'll be pulling it out of places, but it's easy to control. And rattlesnake master in the bottom right um, is loved by bees and wasps um, and other butterflies. It's just a really cool plant, it has almost golf ball size um, flower, flower clusters. Oh goodness, I'll try to go forward more. <laughs> Prairie Sun Drops is a, a primrose that uh, blooms um, beautiful, lots of flowers in the middle of the summer. Wild quinine is a really upright, attractive plant with white flower and really nice glossy foliage. Um, compass plant on the left and then um, prairie dock on the right, they're related to cup plant. Um, these plants can get 10 to 12 feet tall and you can't really move them once you plant them. So um, they're kind of like one and done. Uh, Hori vervain is one of my favorite um, purple plants for uh, the regular garden. We've already talked about Joe pie weeds. Um, we do have golden rods that are um, not super aggressive, but are really showy and not, they don't get too tall. They stay about two to three feet tall, including showy golden rod. And then um, we have a few species of ironweed um, that make really good garden plants. Um, there's one that you might recognize that's called like old field or tall ironweed. That one's a little harder to control, but the smooth ironweed is a really nice landscape plant. Um, running out of time, so I'll try to go fast. Um, so I'm gonna go through some ground covers that are invasive very quickly. Moneywort, also known as Creeping Jenny, still sold um, and still legal to sell. It's a wetland invader. You might um, recognize this. It usually has more of a chartreuse color if you buy it in the nursery and it, people use it as a cascade for um, planters. Um, but it's pervasive um, throughout Indiana and the Eastern part of the US. Periwinkle, um, blooming right now, uh, also known as myrtle, creeping myrtle. Um, those shiny, glossy, evergreen leaves, it's, um, kind of a creeping perennial, and then those flowers. And that's its distribution. So it's escaped everywhere here in Indiana. Um, so just real quick, there's sedges make great ground covers. Um, if you need more information on this, I'd be happy to provide it. But um, there's a lot of species. This is just more for inspiration. There's almost a sedge for every growing condition. And the ones that like the part shade are my favorites, which are featured here. Um, ferns are excellent for ground cover and adding texture and architecture to the garden. And all of these are native ferns found here in Indiana. So Christmas fern, lady fern, royal fern, uh, the marginal wood fern, sensitive fern if you've got a wet area. Um, maidenhair also enjoys really rich, moist soils. And then cinnamon fern, which has these really unique, interesting fertile and infertile frond um, contrast. 
So um, ground covers that flower, uh, including uh, another iris that's native called dwarf crested iris. Mine is blooming right now and I love this time of year every year so I can take photos of it. Um, wild stone crop is our native wild sedum and it's a creeper and it, they all like shade um, and it doesn't ever get much more than two to three inches tall and then it's blooming right now out in the woodlands. Um, bottom below that is golden ragwort. Um, it's an actually evergreen herbaceous plant. And this time of year it blooms a sea of yellow and I just love it to death. I just um, think it's an underappreciated plant because not only does it bloom like this, but it also stays green and provides ground cover all year. Um, golden Alexander is in the carrot family and that one will be blooming here in the spring and it likes wet feet but it, it's fairly short statured. So it, it stays under that like 12 to 18 inches um, and just really nice yellow flowers. Blue mist flower blooms a little later in the season, uh, tends to like a little more sun, but it also likes wet soil conditions or moist soil conditions. Uh, it almost looks like the annual ageratum. And I, I think it grows very similarly, but um, it's a, just a nice plant to let spread. And then on the right is wild ginger. One of my favorite um, kind of native ground covers. It actually blooms below the leaves. Um, so it's not a showy flower, but if you were to look at it, it's pretty cool. Uh, it's pollinated by flies instead of um, bees or butterflies. So um, going into some herbaceous vines, uh, or mostly herbaceous vines, the big leaf periwinkle is related to um, the Vinca minor, it's the Vinca major. Um, and this one often has variegated leaves when we buy it in the garden center. Um, and I am seeing, I have seen this escape in the woodlands. It's not as common as periwinkle, but it's out there. Um, it can also lose its variegation pretty quickly. It has a very similar flower, but larger than the, the creepy myrtle. And then this is what it looks like when it's lost its variegation. So those leaves are a little bit different. And that's its current reported distribution as far as escapes. And one last vine, uh, Sweet Autumn Clematis. This one is kind of an old fashioned clematis, um, very fragrant in the late season, so late summer, early fall, um, very tiny flowers. It has trifoliate leaves um, with mostly smooth edges. Um, and then those that you know, array of white flowers. It's also known as Sweet Autumn Virgin's Bower. And then when it goes to seed, it's these little wispy spirals that are spread by the wind. Um, so we um, have this, and it's pretty widespread, but it's not regulated, um, but it is a highly invasive plant here in Indiana. I see it popping up in woodlands and, and various areas quite a bit. We do have a native virgin spower that is equally beautiful. Um, the only caveat is it's not fragrant. Um, so it's everything that the sweet autumn clematis is except for fragrance. So that's that on the left. Um, some other mostly herbaceous vines that are native, um, mostly for texture, including wild yam, the woolly Dutchman's pipe vine that Elaine mentioned. Um, with that really cool flower. And then moon seed vine um, is also, can also be used to make a really neat um, textured climbing uh, vine. And then on the right, we do have a native um, honeysuckle that's mostly herbaceous called coral honeysuckle. Um, it's not fragrant, but it is um, quite showy and the hummingbirds really enjoy this um, plant. All right, got through the plants. So I'll just give you a few opportunities uh, to learn more and get involved. These are some folks over in Tippecanoe County, um, part of the Tippecanoe Invasives Task Force, um, getting together to pull garlic mustard just uh, this week. <clears throat> so first off, we can just try to learn more about native plants. El Elaine provided some great um, reading material. I highly recommend Douglas Tallamy's book. He has a new one coming out, but Bringing Nature Home and Nature's Best Hope. They're the most inspirational books you can get. Um, he also has a um, project called Homegrown National Park that um, this series is kind of um, inspired by, which is Homegrown uh, Nature Preserve. Um, 
the Xerces Society also has a book called Attracting Native Pollinators. And then there's a book by a woman named Heather Holm. She is a, um, she's a really, she's an insect bee wasp expert. And her book, Pollinators of Native Plants, is very interesting. It has a lot of information on native plants you can have in your yard to support various pollinators. Oh, and I can't forget Indiana Native Plant Society. I'm a member, I know Elaine's a member, I'm sure there's more of you here, but I really recommend their website, it has a lot of resources. Um, they have a really great Facebook group. If you ever have a question on a plant identification, you just post a picture and you'll get some help. Um, and then just be a vigilant gard gardener. Uh, many invasive plants were and still are sold as ornamentals and garden plants. So we have burning bush, um, it's not regulated, but it's highly invasive. Um, so it will likely be regulated. Um, and then we have, um, this This is um, winter creeper, it's a cultivar and it is regulated now, but people are still thinking it's legal and trying to sell it. So be, be careful. There's invasive plants out there that are for sale. Um, plants are often mislabeled. There's all awesome, often multiple plant names. So we wanna make sure we know that scientific name and that it's correct. Um, sometimes a seed mix um, will have contaminants or sometimes you won't even know it, but maybe one of the plants in your wildflower mix um, or your pollinator mix is actually non-native and potentially invasive. So try to get those wildflower mixes that are only have native plants to Indiana. Um, and then gardening is dirty business. So moving mulch, soil, soil amendments, can bring invasives to your yard. Um, so just try to use trusted sellers for those type of materials. Um, and then plant native, uh, that's what this is all about. Um, and then the Indiana Native Plant Society has a program called Grow Indiana Natives. And they have a list of plant sellers that have made the pledge to only sell non-invasive plants and, and they promote, they actually do sell a good selection of natives. Um, and then you can also certify your yard if you have native plantings through that program. And the uh, Indiana Invasive Plant Resources are available through my organization, the Indiana Invasive Species Council website and the Indiana Invasive Plant Advisory Group to the Species Council. Um, we have a Facebook page, so it's kind of, like the Indiana Native Plant Society Facebook group, you can post photos and get some help. If you find invasives, get rid of them. Um, we all already talked about that on another presentation. Um, and then you can get some free assistance through my program. Um, and if I can't help you, I can refer you to a partner that can. But we do free invasive species identification, um, whether via text photo or email photo or a property survey, we'll provide a management plan, or if you have something specific, we can provide that technical assistance on removal. And we can also provide information on where you can get funding if it's available, and then also provide free native planting recommendations um, based on your project for invasive removal. And then volunteer at a weed wrangle near you. We have another one coming up, and it's on May 15th at Thornwood. We, we were a little too early to get the garlic mustard last time. So we're going back and we're gonna keep it from dropping seed, hopefully. And uh, join a SISMA, help us build a SISMA. Um, we have a SISMA call out meeting coming up on May 13th at 6.30. Um, this is the, the event link. You can find it on Facebook and I'm sure that it's also available in a few other areas that they may be able to share if she hasn't already. And last but not least, I'm down to the wire. Spread the word, um, you're the ambassador. Um, these billboards crack me up. And I think I probably showed them before, but um, talk to your friends, your family, let them know. They might know what an invasive plant is. You know, it takes us all that moment where you're like, once you see it, you can't unsee it. So pass that knowledge on and um, maybe we can get ahead on stopping the spread. Thank, Thank you, you for your wonderful <laughs> presentation, Mary. Um, I did have a couple of questions quick. The okay. came through the chat. Um, Julie wants to know if switchgrass grows only in morning sun, is there a light requirement for switchgrass? 
I'm going to say you probably want as, as much sun as you can get. So it probably need at least six hours. All um, right. So I'm not you want, if, yeah. If you want a shady grass, um, I suggest the sedge or the river oats or one of our wild rye. I, I mentioned Canada wild rye, but Virginia wild rye is a really nice one. Um, there's a few others. They're both, they're all perennial, but they're all, the wild rye are somewhat short lived versus the river oats. You'll, you'll have them forever. <laughs> Okay, well, Mary, uh, Mary Ann would like to know, she wants to make sure that flocks, garden flocks, and that flocks we saw on the wild um, flower walk, that's not an invasive, correct? Correct. So um, the one we saw on the wildflower walk, that's the woodland flox. Um, it's right behind me. <laughs> and right. Then, um, this is actually from Morgan County. Um, and it's, it's, they actually have cultivars so you can buy cultivars of it, but the straight native is so beautiful. I, it's, it's just maybe a little easier to find a cultivar. Um, and then the wood, the garden phlox, the tall garden phlox, which is phlox paniculata is native. And the one that I have in my yard is from seed collected growing naturally along our ditch on a, on a roadside. Terrific. Um, several people wanted to know if about buying native plants? Where are the alternative plants available? And I believe that you mentioned several resources defining that. Um, Indiana Native Plant Society can tell you that. We've got a reference here that uh, Mariana sent native plants unlimited shop.com. So that's in the chat. Anything else about buying um, alternative plants? You know, just go to Grow Indiana Natives, and on the right, they have a, the Buy Indiana Natives program, and you can find a list of sellers that sell native plants throughout the state, and they also have lists of people that specialize in landscaping design or installation, so if, you, if you're feeling like you want to get some help, um, that's the place to start. Um, there's a lot of pop-up sales happening right now throughout the state. Um, so a lot of those are listed there. So even if they're not permanent, um, they are there. And I would actually go as far as to say, if you have a mom and pop garden center you like to support and they are carrying, maybe they're carrying some natives, but they're not carrying the one that you want. I would go in and ask because yeah. they're not going to start carrying it um, if if you don't ask um, and the more demand they get, um, the more likely they'll carry it. The other side of that coin is ask them to stop selling burning bush, ask them to stop selling calorie pear. Um, you tell them you want to give them your business, but you know, until we get regulation, these plants are still selling and they're going to try to make money off of them because that's how they get by. So we need to push the market toward natives as much as we can. Okay, there was a suggestion that Geist Nursery is a site that Native Plants Unlimited sells. Um, yes, and, and I think I think they are sold. I think they're done taking orders for this okay. year for that sale, but they may have more coming up. I I try to look at these things fairly often. So there's some going on in Indianapolis right now. Um, if you visit um, the Circle City Sisma website or even keep Indianapolis beautiful website. I think they have some information on some native plant sales that are happening there. Um, Indiana Wildlife Federation sells native plants. Um, Hancock, Hamilton County Soil and Water Conservation District sells native plants. Um, I'm just rattling off the ones that are at top of no, my No, that's head. okay. And yeah. you know what? I hear Hancock County Master Gardeners is having a plant sale this weekend. Yay. At the 40 fairgrounds, and we have some native plants for sale. Yay. So don't go to guys, go over to um, the 4 H fairgrounds and visit the Hancock County Master Gardeners on either Friday or Saturday. And the last question is a suggestion for a taller grass that'll grow in full sun that the monarchs can perch on and their chrysalis can form. I say switchgrass 100% because it's really upright, dense, it provides protection. So you can plant it right next to your milkweeds if you got common milkweed. Um, switchgrass is probably the most um, easy to landscape with. The other one, prairie drop seed, a little shorter, 
and then big little blue stem. Those are the top three for full sun. I just want to thank everybody for sticking with us. And if you're interested in trees and shrubs and woody vines, come make sure you tune in next month because we'll have a lot of options to talk about. Thank you. Congratulations, Master Gardeners. <laughs> thank you, everybody. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Okay, we're done. So, uh, Gary, you don't have much time for anything.